mentioned some of these problems. So suppose that you have a number n, and let's suppose it's large, and you have a subgroup of the symmetric group, sim n, and now you want to solve problems of the following kind. For example, you have two elements of your group G, and you want to know whether or not they are conjugate. And then probably, if they are conjugate, you also want to have a conjugating element. Um, same here, you have subgroups, and you want to know whether they're conjugate with a conjugating element, if possible. Also, Alice already mentioned group intersection. That's another problem we want to solve quickly. And now we enter the Champions League, <laughs> normalizer computation. So you have two subgroups. You want to calculate the normalizer of one of the subgroups and the other one. That's hard. So there's group intersection that is somewhere in the middle. There's these conjugacy problems. There's calculating various stabilizers of objects. So now I'm just talking about group elements, but of course we can generalize this and say you have combinatorial structures that the symmetric group acts on. It could be graphs or partitions or your favorite thing. And then you want to have um, information about orbits, about things being in the same orbit, you know, stuff like that. Johannes asked the question yesterday that is related to this but in a slightly different context, because you wouldn't have a permutation group, you would have a matrix group, and it would act on something, and then you ask, even if you know that two things are on the same orbit, you would like to have an element that maps one to the other. So this is related to this first question, and I will hopefully remember to come back to this later in my talk. Okay, so these, these are the questions we would like to look at. Um, I will not talk very much about this, in particular because there are people in the room who know a lot about this, and we will hear something about that later. So let me say two more things. Um, when we search for things, then what we are given is usually given by a generating set, and what we want to find is also a generating set. Uh, one more comment. These problems are not just interesting by themselves, but also because they are very often components in more complex functions, which is why if these get quicker, then everything gets quicker. And then if you have huge experiments, you want all these things to be fast. And final comment, if we, let's say we, we start searching naively, what could we do? So if we have, for example, two subgroups and we want to look at the intersection, what could we do? We could say we look at all the elements in the big group and we do membership testing for the two subgroups. And if they are members of the two subgroups, then they're in the intersection. But then you have to look at all the elements in the big group. And that's stupid. <laughs> that's not too bad. If we know the group orders, then you can say, OK, I take the smaller group and I only look at those elements and check them for membership in the other one. That seems to be a smaller problem. But still. Here's an unrelated question. How do you check for primality computationally? You don't check for all the possible dividers, right? What do you do? So the development of primality testing um, at some point went, but if it takes too long to check all the possible divisors, let's take properties of prime numbers, properties that distinguish them from composite numbers, and use those to design tests. So mass little theorem and more fancy versions of that, or um, things with quadratic residues, there you go. Then you have lots of nice primality tests. So if we wanted to have a similar approach here, then it would be something like, rather than looking at all the group elements individually, let's try and find a, a structure that helps us distinguish group elements that we want from group elements we don't want. So let's maybe have this as a guiding theme for what comes next. Because I want to actually look for a specific intersection with you. This is a little example. Maybe it's just about interesting enough. I have two subgroups of some eight, and I want to intersect them. And now let's see how this can be done uh, computationally. So we have this subgroup here. Do we see anything interesting? Uh, orbits, maybe. Okay. 
maybe that's interesting. And then there's the subgroup B here that looks very transitive on one to eight. So the first thing that we do, and I will skip over lots of details and simplify, and I apologize for that, but I just want to give you lots of flavors of things, of methods. Um, so I would like to start with And this goes back to 1971. And um, this is based on the fact that you have a base and then a special generating set in the stabilizer chain, blah, blah, blah. So thanks to, uh, let me think, Melissa and Veronica, I think, who mentioned this. Alice mentioned it too in her talk. So let's have a base for these two groups. One, four is a base. So my example will be short because the base is short, but hopefully I can sort of explain some of the principles that I would work here. So I want to search for elements in A intersect B by looking at how group elements act on the base points. So I have a first level coming from the first base point. That's here. So where could the number one be mapped to by the two groups that we have? So for the group A, it could be mapped to anything from 1 to 6. And for the group B, it could even be mapped to anything from 1 to 8. So let's start with A, because there the orbit is shorter for 1. And then we have 6 possibilities where 1 could go, 1 to 6. And now let's keep looking. So if, let's say, if 1 is mapped to 1, so the first base point is now taken care of with respect to A, so I have the orbits of A in my mind. And now I keep looking what happens with the second base point four, because once I know what happens to these two base points, I know everything. Okay, this we have seen before. So where could four go? Let's see, here's the stabilizer of one. Four could go to, could go to four, five, or six. So that's the three possibilities I have here. So somehow when we fix one, now we have three possibilities. So I will denote this as a branching in the search. So if one is mapped to one, then four could be mapped to four, five, or six. This is unfortunately already the end of our search tree. If the base was longer, then you could imagine moving down further. And then a lot of what we are doing in the next few minutes will um, illustrate how you can um, make the search smaller by ignoring parts of the search tree. And here the search tree is just small because the base is short. But let's just keep looking what we can do. So if one is mapped to one and four is mapped to four, then because this is a base, there's only one group element that can do that, namely the identity. So the group element that we end up seeing here below is the identity, of course, that's in the intersection. And next, one could go to one, and four could go to five, for example. Is that possible? Indeed, yes it is, because in the stabilizer in the L1, it is possible to move four to five. Okay. What about the next one? If one goes to one, and four goes to six, is that possible? Oops, no it isn't. So that's where we cut the search. So we are already at the bottom, so maybe this is not that important now, but if the search tree was longer, that would be one of these places where you can reason with the orbits and say, we don't need to look further down this branch of the search tree just because we already see that with the orbits it doesn't work. Ignore that. Okay, so here this is possible. Here it's not possible because of the B1 orbits. But just to give you one more example where we actually find something in the intersection, if you move along here, the next possibility is two, then three. Just for completeness, I will write them down. But let's look at what happens if one is mapped to three. So now we don't look at the point stabilizer, but the coset with the elements that map one to three. And again, if one is mapped to three, we have three possibilities where four could go, namely, again, four, five, six. And here's an example. One could go to three, and four could go to six, and the element that we get out here is one, three, two, four, six, five, 
and that actually is an element in the intersection. So now we have seen all the possibilities, what can happen during the search. Maybe we find a branch where we argue, oh, nothing interesting can happen there, or maybe we find an element in, in the intersection. And the whole idea of this backtrack search method a la Sims is that you use a base and um, the infrastructure that comes with the base and strong generating set and, and stabilizer chain in order to organize the search in the group and to insert information that you have such that you can cleverly prune the search tree and just ignore lots of bits. That's the basic idea that is behind that. Backtrack a la Sims. And this was the state of the art for a while. And then, oh, maybe I can do this here. And then Leon came along and introduced partition backtrack search. So now we do backtrack search a la Leon. Partition backtrack. Uh, oops, backtrack a la Leon. And that's 97, I believe. No, 91. Sims, Leon. Mm. So this was just a completely different idea. Rather than moving, I mean, with the um, with the space approach, we still move along the group elements somehow. Now instead, we use an infrastructure that takes elements, or um, I should say, it takes sets of combinatorial objects that the group acts on, and we approximate the group we are looking for by, depending on what the problem is, the stabilizer of such a combinatorial object, or the set of group elements that map one of these objects to another object. So for example, if you look for normalizers, then you could approach the normalizer approximated by a subgroup that stabilizes something that the group also stabilizes, and therefore it has to be stabilized by the normalizer, for example, if you find something like this. Or in this case, let's look at A and B. Leon thought of partitions, so now we are going to write down partitions that somehow capture something of the group structure, and then we say, if you're an element of A, then you have to stabilize this partition. If you're an element of B, you have to stabilize this partition. So if you're an element of the intersection, you have to stabilize the meat of these partitions. Let's just do that. So write, let's write down, for example, an orbit partition. That's the easiest thing we can start with. And orbit calculation is easy. It can be done quickly, just like point stabilizers. So let's just use that. And for A, let's take an ordered orbit partition for both groups. So for A, this would be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and then 7, 8. This is how I denote partitions. These are the cells. And for B, well, B is transitive, so this is boring. OK. So A intersect B stabilizes the meat, which is this one. And that's the only information that we have so far. That's not very much. So now we look, we look and again, we have a backtrack approach Oh, and if you're wondering, I will tell you later what the intersection is. <laughs> it's not very big. Mm. So now the approach is to again have an infrastructure so that we can create a search tree. And again, the idea is to move along the search tree according to certain rules, how we split, blah, blah, blah. And to backtrack and stop looking once we have information that tells us that further down the road, there's nothing interesting for us to find. So what could this look like in the partition language? Given that we don't get any more information out of the orbits, we now have to kind of split up the search and look for various possibilities what could happen. Just like over here, where at the end of the search we found individual permutations. The same should happen here, but we don't see permutations. So where do they come from? They come from the approximations. So the intersection of A and B stabilizes this partition. So the stabilizer of this partition in the big symmetric group, some eight, is our first approximation of this intersection. And now we want to make it finer. And at the end of the search process, again, we want to have individual permutations that are candidates for A intersect B. 
And then given that we have narrowed down the search so much, to do a membership testing then, just to be on the safe side, is not a problem. So how do we split the search into several parts? So the splitting works with rules. So for example, it could be take the smallest cell and split there. Or it could be if there is an ordering on the set, take the cell with the smallest entry and split that, whatever. So if you implement this, you need rules. I'm working on the blackboard. I just do something that is nice because we worked with the stabilizer of one here or the possibilities where one could get mapped. I'm going to take the cell that contains one to be in parallel with the example over there. So how could this partition split? It could be that I fix one, by which I mean that I take one away and do put it to the end. So it would mean that, um, maybe I can do it on both sides. So the first partition on the left side will always be our reference partition. So I think of stabilizing one. So I put it to the end, like this. And on the right-hand side, I have the possibilities where one could be mapped, just like over there. So one could be fixed, so I just have the same. Or it could be mapped to all the numbers from two to six. So I get all these different partitions here. Let me just write a few. One, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, with a two at the end. One, two, four, five, six, seven, eight, with a three at the end, and so on. So now, what, where am I in my search tree? What permutations am I looking at? So I split the approximation from this partition up into six subsets, namely the set of permutations that maps this partition to this partition, so it just stabilizes union with the set of permutations that maps this partition to this partition, and so on. So this is how I have now split up the search, and then I can use reasoning, whatever kind of reasoning from the group, whatever, in order to find out whether there is a branch that I can ignore. So that's basically the contribution of writing good algorithms a la Leon, using this infrastructure and then finding clever ways how you can reason in order to prune the search tree. So you have the rules for splitting. Maybe that can be done in a clever way somehow. And then you also have rules for finding out that you don't need to follow down a branch. So let's find something in parallel to over here. So this would mean that I, if I move from here to here, then it means that I map this cell to this cell, this to this, that's easy, and one to three, and this permutation that we already found does it, for example, but also it's square. So again, we, we kind of find the permutations in a similar way to before, but using a different infrastructure. Now we're using the language of partitions and of stabilizers of partitions or transporter sets from one partition to the next. So this would be back, backtrack a la Leon. And as you can see, maybe, We split once and we have these six, this, these six possibilities and maybe you can somehow use information, for example, again, point stabilizers to get rid of some of these branches. But it looks as if potentially this could be bad because maybe you get rid of some of them, but then you still end up with these potentially big cells and you keep splitting, so this could still take. It depends on the information you use and how well it is represented in a partition. So now the question that hopefully becomes interesting is, how can we find information about the groups we are dealing with that sort of lets us take in this information into a partition in a way so that we don't lose much? Hmm. This is where I get into the picture, together with Chris Jefferson and Marcus Pfeiffer, because we felt that for some groups, if you use other combinatorial structures and try and feed this information into the partitions, you might get down to smaller cells more quickly, which means that you reach the leaves at the end of the tree more quickly, and also get rid of more things more quickly during the search. Okay. So what we used
So let's say improvements, because actually, if you look at our paper from 2019, um, it's called New Refiners for something, Permutation Group Algorithms or something like this, 2019, um, and that's Chris Jefferson, Marcus Pfeiffer, and me. We use graphs that capture information from the groups, for example, orbital graphs that we heard about, <laughs> orbital graphs, and we use them to produce refiners that make the partitions um, smaller more quickly. And we chose some hard problems for our experiments and we were surprised how much improvement could be gained by just using some graphs for some groups. And orbital graphs are not even useful if the group is highly transitive. But still, they turned out to be very useful in practice for many problems. So if you want to check out the experiments and if you want to know more, ask me at the end or check the paper out um, by using orbital graphs. But still what we did was very much respecting Leon's work and all the structure. So we didn't throw everything away. We said, let's use this framework and just get refiners that are informed by graphs so that the search becomes quicker. But then from there, maybe it's not so far away to say, ah, every time you build a graph and you transport the information and then you refine something and you transport the information back into the partition, you have these transfers and they cost time and effort and wouldn't it, wouldn't it be better if we had a new framework, a new infrastructure, so that we could introduce all the information we have more directly and we don't go back and forth with partitions? Right? So that's when the idea of graph backtracking was born. So graph backtracking, that's the next step. Backtracking. So this is a la uh, Jefferson, Pfeiffer, Weidecker, Wilson. This is uh, Wolf Wilson who was a postdoc with me for a while. And I should say that a lot of grant money went into this. Royal Society, DFG, um, Volkswagen Stiftung, blah, blah, blah. So we had this idea and we got quite excited and we felt this should work and it's just a matter of finding the right words and finding the right mathematical description. Basically, we have a feeling we know how to do this, and then of course implementing it. But we felt that graphs would be such a great infrastructure for these search methods because computers can deal with graphs really nicely. There are lots of good algorithms for graphs, mm -hmm. like practically really good algorithms. So that was our idea, and that's the next bit I want to uh, tell you about. What we kept from Leon was the idea that we use an infrastructure and that we search for group elements by searching for elements that stabilize a structure or map a structure to another one, just like with the partitions. But now we are using stacks of labeled digraphs. That's a mouthful. So I will only write graphs. But what I mean when I write graphs is it's a, gra it's a directed graph. You're, you can have directions. You can have labels at arcs or at vertices or both, and you can do everything you want, basically. You can store as much information there in the graph as you like. And then you usually don't just look at one graph, but you use um, stacks of them. So you put them in a list, and you keep adding graphs as you keep adding information. And it's very direct because you just put the graphs there, and you don't transfer the information to, to anything else. So we, instead of approximating A to sec B by the stabilizer of a partition and then refining, we now approximate A to sec B, and this transfers to many other problems, but let me stick to a group intersection, um, by the set of well, the group of permutations in some N that map a graph stack, and I said that graph is simplified for something more, a graph stack, let's say S, to a graph stack T. Hmm, so that's different. Oh, uh, there are 
papers and packages for this. I should give you some numbers. And publications, of course. Um, No, so I didn't write down the, the year, maybe 2021. Not entirely sure, but there are several articles. So there is this original graph backtracking paper that we named in reference to Leon, similar to Leon's paper. And it's also all on the archive. So it's easy to find if you type Chris's and my name or something. Sorry, I don't have the year right now. So there are several papers, and the first one is a really big one where we explain this whole idea and the whole setup. And what would this look like in our example? So we had this group A and the group B, and we could say, well, they live in sim 8, so we just take a graph that has vertices 1 to 8, and we don't add anything else because one of the groups is transitive, even, so let's just say we're boring. We take sim 8 as our first very bad approximation for the intersection of A and B. We just take the, the graph that has the front eight. So start with this graph gamma for both stacks. Yeah. Gamma is just this graph with no information, just vertices. And then we could say, oh, what information do we have? Oh, we have orbits. OK, so we could add another graph to the stack on both sides, because we are doing everything simultaneously right now, um, where we color vertices depending on um, what orbit they belong to. So we could have gamma O for orbits, where we say, OK, these two are special, and the others are their own thing, and that's another graph. Mm -hmm. Then the next one is, let's say, S1. No, that's not good. Uh, S prime. So we add a, add a graph to the stack. Gamma O for orbits. Anything else we can do? Anything exciting? Uh, not really. So if we were in parallel to Leon's idea, then we would now fix a point and branch. But didn't I say that I wanted to use graphs more cleverly? I did, didn't I? Mm -hmm. Orbital graphs. Mm -hmm. We have two interesting graphs for A. So let's just uh, remind ourselves how this works. So I create the orbital graph for A with, let's say, the starting arc 1, 7 by taking this arc and then mapping it with all the elements from A. And then I get this beautiful little graph. And then I can do the same if I start with the arc from 1 to 2, and again I apply all the elements of A, I get another little graph, and then I also have a graph for B, which is good because I want to capture information from both groups. And here I, and I started with 1, 6, and I noticed that they always go in both directions, so I didn't put arrows there. So let's take these graphs. 1, 2, add them to the stacks, and still we're doing the same on both sides. So we always approximate this intersection by the set of permutations stabilizing this stack of graphs, which means that you have to induce automorphisms on each graph in the stack. That's what we're doing. Then the next one is S double prime. So we add the orbital graphs into our analysis. And in practice, in the implementation, at some point, we start squashing the graphs together and have then one graph with lots of labels, and then we have all the information in one place. But anyway, I'd like to keep writing it like this. And I should add primes here. Hmm. OK. How can we now reason with these, with these graph stats? Maybe we find out, oh, it's only the trivial automorphism um, that stabilizes all this. Uh, but no, we know that there are elements in the intersection. There should, should be something more interesting. There should be some interesting automorphisms. So how can we now mimic adding further information if we are kind of done with all the clever reasoning, like orbits, orbital graphs, 
what do we do now? Well, if we have no other idea, then we split. So we could say, and how does splitting look like in this framework? Splitting means that, so before splitting me means um, taking a number and then deciding where it can go and looking at all the possibilities. So it's fixing it or it, it goes to the possibilities. So we could do the same here, which means that we take our graph, color just one vertex, and then on the left-hand side, that vertex is going to be colored. And then on the right-hand side, you have the possibility the same vertex is colored, so you stabilize this point. Or the point gets mapped to something else that is colored. But in any case, we only color one point. So this is where we split. So let's say that S3 prime, no, yeah, let's do it, becomes the same thing. And at the end, we add a graph that I will call gamma circle one, because I, I used circle already, box, box one. And by that I mean the graph where I only box the number one and everything else is untouched. So it's like fixing one. That's how you can imagine it if you, look, if you think in automorphisms of graphs. On the right hand side I split, so I have T3 prime 1, which is the same. But then I can also take something else. So I could, for example, box 2 or 3 or whatever. So same as over there, but then I do this. So somehow it's taking information that we want to use for refinement, putting them in the graph, and then adding this graph to the stack. Hmm, let's look at the situation where one is fixed. How is this now better than fixing one in a partition? So I want to convince you that we actually have more information now. I better should, right? <laughs> With all this framework and all this new stuff. Since we are now looking at the stabilizer of this graph stack, we not only want to stabilize one, we also want to induce automorphisms on all these other graphs. So we have to respect the orbital graph structure. And let's look what happens. If we fix one, then this graph tells us that we have to fix two because it's the only um, outgoing neighbor, and then three because it's the only outgoing neighbor. Interesting. We also certainly fix seven from this graph, Let's do it again. If we fix one, then this graph tells us we fix two and three. This graph tells us we fix seven. This graph tells us everything is fixed. Because if one is fixed, then, it ha then six is fixed, two was also fixed, and four, uh -huh, everything is fixed. And the same for the other possibilities. So wherever one is mapped, the combination of the three graphs tells us exactly what the permutation is. So we get candidates for the intersection of A and B. And the intersection actually is, I should write this down at some point, just to solve the miracle. I have to solve the puzzle. It's, I think it's this, I will double check. Oops. It's a group of size six. Just make sure it's the right one. Uh, oh no, the six. It's a six cycle in the middle. One, four, three, six, two, five. Three, six, two, five, and now you can recover elements we already found as uh, powers of this. So I'm almost at the end. Oh yes, I'm almost at the end. Great. Could you just show what happens if you use T two triple dash? Yes. So in that case, so here we are in the branch of the search where we look for permutations that stabilize this, because this is certainly something that approximates A into B. Here we look at the part of the search where we map this graph stack to this graph stack, which means that we have to induce automorphisms on all these graphs, and then we have to map this graph with one boxed to this graph with two boxed. So it means we have to map one to two while respecting everything else. Let's see how this works. If we map, let's just do this. If we map one to two, then this graph tells us 
that we have to map 2 to 3 and 3 to 1. This graph tells us that if we map 1 to 2, then we have to map 6 to 4. Also, we already had that, three goes to, uh, that 2 goes to 3, so 4 goes to 5. So now what do I have? Let me write it down. 1 goes to 2, 2 goes to 3. We also had, uh, yeah, and that's it, because 3 has to go to 1. And then we have, um, what did I say? 6 goes to 4. Yeah, and 4 goes to 5. Am I doing it wrong? Maybe it's 1 goes to... No, that was right, 2 goes to 3, so 4 goes to 5. So the, the reasoning is, is the same in the sense that if you just follow where the, where the elements get mapped and then you move to another orbital graph if you run out of information and then you transfer the information there and then you get your permutation, and if you don't get a precise permutation, then at least you get a much smaller subset of permutations. So for example, maybe you don't know whether 7 or 8 are interchanged or fixed, but that's fine. So in this case, if you map 1 to 2, 2 to 3, and 3 to 1, then 7 has to be fixed and so on. So you can do some more reasoning there. And in the same way, you can find out that something doesn't work. So because maybe you find information like, oh, if one goes there, then this graph tells me this information, another graph tells me something contradictory, and then you know you can stop. So that's how the reasoning works with the graph sets. Is that better for you, Christian? That's almost all I wanted to say. So a lot of our recent... Oh, no, that's not all I wanted to say, because I have not yet talked about canonical images. So let me... Yeah, I have five minutes, that's fine. So let me erase this because I want to combine what we just did with the graph stacks with the idea of canonical image. And canonical image is also the solution to many of the problems that have to do with congeners and so on. So here's what canonical image does. So now we are not just in a symmetric group acting on points, but you can imagine that your symmetric group acts on any set of combinatorial objects, like partitions, graphs, blah, blah, blah. And let's call the set of objects we act on Obj. And it relates to some set omega, 1 to n, n is large. So this is um, a set of combinatorial objects that soon n, n is still from n acts on. And now I define a canonical image of an element from here, or not, let's say a canonizing function maybe first. Um, canon is a canonizing function on the set of objects, objects, if and only if it's, an, it's a function from this object set to itself. And if it satisfies for all objects, let's say A and B, oops, can't write this, objects. So first of all, the, the image, which I then call the canonical image, is in the orbit. So canon of A is in the orbit of A under the group G that is acting. So we can, we can actually now do this for subgroups and not just for the full symmetric group, which is progress. So I should say that. Um, and also, if two elements are in the same orbit, uh, if A is in the orbit of B, then they have the same canonical image, hence the name canonical. So one example, and this goes back to work of Linton, for example, from 2004, I believe, is minimal image. So if you have an ordering on the set you are acting on, then you can find minimal images by just saying, well, I look at all the images, I have an ordering, and I take the smallest one, and that's my canonical image. Very nice, very easy example. Depending on the ordering that you have, it might take a long time to find it. So in our paper on this topic, 
from 2019, the same, the same authors. We show that you can improve this massively by changing the ordering dynamically. So we give an example where we show that the ordering really plays a role in how quickly you find a minimal image. And then if you are clever, you can just find it much more quickly by changing the ordering. So this is a way how you can find a clinical image. And this is also how we do it now in practice in the implementation. We use the stack idea, the graph stack idea, and I will be more precise in a moment, in order to construct a canonical image by manipulating everything in a permutation invariant way until we narrow down the possibilities to a tiny set and then we take a prescribed ordering and calculate the minimal image and that's our canonical image. So that's how practically we do it and it works nicely. It really does. So magma must have something really clever that's similar because they have this um, canonical representative thing and there must be a reason why magma is so fast with conjugacy questions and so on. So I guess there must be something there. But I don't know because I don't know the code. So let's say we want to calculate the canonical image of a graph and I prepared one. Um, one, six, two, seven, that's the first bit of the graph. And then we have this. Okay, canonical image, what do we do? Um, we build a graph stack that captures information and then we sort of narrow things down to just a few possibilities. So we want to work with a graph that has vertices one to eight. We can of course take this original graph, it captures some information, so let's call this graph gamma. Then we can say that our stack starts yeah, I often start with the empty stack for some reason, but let me sort of simplify the notation and say we start with gamma. Uh, I should tell you where I'm looking for a minimal image, so I'm not looking in sim 8, because that would be easy. I want to look in a more interesting group, G, and I don't know this by heart. One, it's fairly big, one, two, three, four, five, six, eight. One, three, two, six, four, five, and one, six, two, three, four, five, seven, eight. We are again in sim eight, and I'm looking for a canonical image of this graph under this group. So hopefully this is strange enough so you don't see it immediately. Good. Okay, maybe good. <laughs> um, so I could say, well, if I work under this group, then I might as well take some structure of this group into account, for example, orbits. Oh, but it's transitive, so that's no information. Okay, so what can I do? I can take information from the graph. So for example, I could say, these three guys only have one neighbor, so they are special. These have two neighbors, so they belong to one bit, and this has three neighbors, so it gives me I'm going to write down a partition, but I really mean a graph where I color the vertices accordingly. Um, so it's like neighboring color, whatever. Mm. So it's three, four, five, because they have one neighbor, then one, two, six, seven, and then eight. And we see eight is now special. So we have to stabilize eight, and, or, Maybe we don't have to stabilize eight, but eight is special. So we could start by mapping eight to its smallest possible <laughs> image, which is one because the group is transitive. So we keep in mind that later we want to map eight to one. And then we look in that coset, where could the next number go? And the graph structure doesn't give us all the possibilities that some eight gives us. So we proceed by saying, okay, if eight is stabilized, then we can look at the stabilizer of eight in G, and later we apply the permutation that maps eight to one. So it's a graph that captures information about the number eight, a little bit like this. But then we're stuck, and then we have to split. And the splitting gives us possibilities. So we could, for example, say we take the next cell of small size, this one, and then as before, the search splits, we have six branches according to fixing first three, then four, then five, or three, then five, then four, and so on, or four, then three, then five, blah, 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 six permutations, six branches. And let me just describe one branch for you that we get when we go to the 
the, to the end, because then we get a, part, a graph where every vertex is individualized with a different color. And in the implementation, you have to decide how you do this. So we did this, and it's in the paper. It's on the archive, I think, since yesterday. So check it out. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so the, the, final, the final thing here in the stack, if we follow down the branch with three, four, and then five, is the one where the final bit is first eight, then three, then four, then five, then one, then two, then six, then seven. And we get six more of these. So these are potential elements of uh, potential canonical images. And of the six, we choose the minimal one under G. And the one that we get is, let me just write down the graph that we get. Canonical image, because if I apply to the graph, then you can reverse engineer what this is. The canonical image of this graph, if I follow this process, and, to, and, and take the minimal image among the six leaves that I get, then the graph is one, eight becomes one. I already told you why this happens, because one is the smallest image that eight can go to, and we saw that we picked eight right in the beginning. And then you cannot map these to two, three, and four, unfortunately, but you can map them to two, three, and six. And then over here, you get the remaining numbers. Let me put them in the right order. Four, seven, eight, five. And this is how we combine the graph stack idea from our search work with the idea of canonical image. And that's implemented in Vol. Matsi knows a lot about that. So check it out. Check out the paper. Check out the graph backtrack package. Check out Vol if you're interested. We are now able to solve way more problems than we could before. We also get quicker with many problems. And of course, for some, we're still not as good as Magma, unfortunately. But we have ideas here. And you can refine this. There are so many places where you can optimize and refine even more with these new ideas that we think there's really potential. And who knows? I mean, there's still Champions League, right? There's still Normalizer. So that's where I stop. Are there a couple, are there questions for Rebecca? Yes. Of course, me. Is it uh, uh, by chance happened that you know, Three, four, five, one, two, six, seven. This, uh, I think, uh, is similar to the complement of this graph. Um, you know, does, it, does it happen by chance? I don't know. I think I would have to sit down and complement. write this down with you what exactly you mean. Yeah, because this, uh -huh. is, this is really just a partition that separates the vertices of the graph by a number of neighbors. So it's not meant to be um, something like an incidence pattern or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but maybe we can discuss your question later in more detail so I understand it correctly. Thank you. There are questions? Can I ask a question? Yes, so um, if you do graph isomorphism, then the ideas that they usually use is the Weisfeiler Lehmann idea, which is goes sort of several steps down the same track, not yeah. just the degrees of the neighbors, but the degrees yeah. of the degrees. Does that help you as well? Can you sort of it definitely informs some of our ideas. And very often in practice, when you implement it, this is where you look. So you look, yeah. what's a good way to implement this? Because we have to find. So we can reason. We can look at the graphs and say, oh, it's a good idea to fix this vertex, because then we have lots of information. But the algorithm doesn't know that. Mm. And so yes, we, we have to, to, to find ways to, to tell the algorithm how to do something, for example, take the smallest orbit, split there. If you have several, then take the ordering we have and take the one with the smaller entry, or something like this. So it has to be something that is, at best, permutation invariant. So if we use the ordering, we have to be careful even. Singling out one vertex, for example, in the ordering, we cannot decide which of these graphs is smaller. Yeah. They are the same. No, but I meant like in the one before that, the, the first partition, you mm -hmm. could maybe refine that partition already. Absolutely, that would be a wonderful improvement. Yeah. Yes, so this was just one example where this was one way to go and it moves us down very quickly, but absolutely, yes. Yes. Yeah. And also, of course, it would be nice to have similar ideas for matrix groups. It's just so much harder. I don't know where to start with canonical images for. 
questions? Okay, thank you again, Rebecca.